Yay! Yay! <laughs> oh man, I'm excited. This is gonna be a good one. I think it's gonna be one of the most anticipated Ginger Runner lives <laughs> ever. Uh, welcome everyone to Ginger Runner Live, episode number two hundred and fifty-four. Uh, the reason I'm so excited, and I think Kim is moderately excited. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very very excited. excited. <laughs> uh, our guest. I'm I'm actually pluralizing this because we have two guests, kind of a surprise guest, which I'm actually really excited about as well. But Scott Jurek and Jenny Jurek are going to be joining us on the show tonight. There's like people from around the yes. world that are staying up in their time zone so they can watch this live. Yeah, it's it's that big of a show. We're very excited. We're going to talk about their book North, uh, all about their AT, FKT, plus more. We have a wonderful connection with them to the Pacific Northwest. We're going to talk to them about what it's like to train there and for here for us, mm -hmm. uh, them now living in Boulder and their journeys and their adventures together. So sit back, relax, everyone, because uh, Ginger Runner Live episode number 254, one of the biggest ones yet, uh, begins right now. Yay! Yay! What is up, everybody? <laughs> Welcome to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 254. Uh, we're getting up there. We are getting up there. Yeah. I think <laughs> 253 episodes have trained us for this one. We've been practicing the, just to try and like nail this episode. We have to nail this episode. <laughs> so far, uh, we're doing okay. We're doing fine. <laughs> we're at about 90%. We got to get up to 100%. I'm so excited about tonight's episode yes. because we have one of the biggest legends of ultra running joining us tonight one of the names who i learned about early on in my ultra running career mm -hmm. and just tried to learn from and absorb just these stories and and tales of uh, this individual scott jurek scott jurek is going to be joining us on the show tonight and a surprise guest jenny jurek is also going to be joining us we're going to talk to them about uh their at adventure i'm going to say appalachian trail appalachian trail every state i went to in the south told me i was pronouncing it, it incorrectly uh -huh. So I'm just going to say AT. Uh, their <laughs> AT FKT attempt in 2015 and their brand new book, North, which we got to listen to as well as now flipping through it and reading it. Uh, their paperback comes out tomorrow, which is pretty cool. You'll be able to order that. We're going to talk to them all about that on tonight's show. Uh, but it's not just me. It's also. Hi, guys. Hi. My name is Kim. As always, I'm here. Um, we are live. We have Scott and Jenny with us right mm -hmm. now so if you guys have questions for either of them please pop them into the chat room we'll be pulling questions throughout the hour and of course we uh would not be able to do this show or our reviews or our films without the wonderful support of our patreon supporters mm -hmm. if you go to patreon.com slash the ginger runner for as little as a dollar a month it supports everything we do here three of those individuals in particular at the top tier uh help us week in week out month after month brian sands is an amazing human has lost over 100 pounds in his journey uh, ran his first marathon, his first 50K, training for his first 50 miler. <clears throat> super inspiring. <laughs> Sorry, there's a flake of Get, pepper in my throat. Um, he's a super inspiring individual and has just a wonderful story. So big shout out to Brian. Chris Lee in Hong Kong has been a big supporter of Ginger Runner Live. And he and his organization Trailblazer showcase all of the amazing trails in Hong Kong. So if you find yourself overseas uh, in that area, make sure you reach out to Chris or the Trailblazer community. And Rick Bjarnison. Rick and his team at CheekyMonkeyMedia.ca completely redesigned the GingerRunner.com website. Uh, he himself is an ultra runner training for Sinister 7 and the Fat Dog 120, two of uh, Western Canada's biggest, most difficult races, and it's been awesome to follow his yeah. journey. So big shout out to those three individuals for making it happen. Uh, without further ado, it's just time to bring them on because they are waiting patiently in the wings. <laughs> they uh, are just too of the biggest names in ultra running and in running in general, Scott and Jenny Jurek. Yay! Hi, guys. Thanks Welcome. For Welcome. Well done. Thank you, finally. <laughs> uh, we apologize for the 253 episodes before this one. We just, we had to practice. We had to practice. <laughs> I can't believe you've done that, man. That's impressive. Yeah. It's five it's years. It's a lot of Mondays. It's a lot of Mondays. <laughs> Um, but it's it's an honor to have you both on the show tonight. Just being able to uh, uh, speak with you, speak with you on your adventures and ask the questions that have been like in my brain since I've heard the legends of Scott Jurek. And it, it, I'm like so excited about that. Um, 
where are you coming to us from? Because I know you travel a lot. You are both out there doing book tours and adventures of your own. Uh, where are we currently? We're in Boulder, back at home. We're oh, good. In, we're in our garage because <laughs> <laughs> we have one baby sleeping and then one who is staying up late and reading books behind us. So hopefully she'll be quiet and distracted enough for the next hour. How often do you find yourselves at home? Like, do you, are you able to like spend a good amount of time at home and actually relax for a little bit? Or is life the constant travel and the constant appearances and book tours and everything like that? I've tried to keep it, we've tried to keep it a little bit more sane these days. I mean, last year was um, pretty nuts, you know, hauling around a, a month old baby uh, in tow along with a two year old. So it was a little crazy, but um, I'd say, yeah, the last four or five months I've stuck around and I do a lot of like leave late, come back early <laughs> type things. So um, that's the life uh, lately, just to be able to keep the uh, the routine at home. And yeah, it's a little bit different, but it's it's also been good for us. And do you normally travel together or Jenny, are you doing your own things and your own traveling? Because I know that you both have very uh, distinct careers and stuff like that. Are you able to find your time together or is it mostly separate? Well, we when we only had one baby, we traveled together. But now with two, it's kind of, it's more like he does his thing and then I'll like bang out a race like Chuck and I was there mm -hmm. Friday and left on Monday morning and I'm um, going to go do Big Sur. Same thing, just like in the day before and I'm literally going to run to the airport right after I finish. <laughs> so it's kind of, we do like solo missions right now, but hoping to do more family travel soon. <laughs> Uh, it's, I think when, when Jenny and I were emailing about scheduling, scheduling this, I think she was mentioning something like, oh, we might be on a big camping trip together. And I was like, mm -hmm. oh, how, I am so sorry. I don't want to interrupt a camping <laughs> trip. Uh, I know how much like family time would probably mean to you guys. So I appreciate you taking the time out, uh, from your garage to join us. tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to remind everyone that we, of course, are live with Scott and Jenny Jurek. If you have questions for either of them about anything, adventures or any of that kind of stuff, jump into the chat room. Kim, I'm assuming there's some activity going there, on. There's so many questions rolling in. I'm just trying to like sift through them right now. Do we want to take take a question? Or sure. Two yeah. Right if, now? You've got, if you've got sure. one, pull aside, let's take one now. We'll just get right into it. Yeah, we have a ton of questions. Um, Lots of questions from one of our favorite question askers, Nathaniel. And Nathaniel asks, uh, Scott, having been a one, of, one of Ultra Running's first sponsored athletes, how has the role of sponsors changed over the year? And do you think sponsor influence is positive? Yeah, it's an interesting thing because when I started, it there wasn't, you know, there really wasn't hardly any money in it. And so I come from, you know, maybe a little old school and, and thinking like, okay, this you know, has changed. But I don't want to be one of those old school people like, oh, the sport's changing and you know, athletes, the money is changing the sport. Because to me, I think the sport at its core is the same. You are going to have some differences in terms of some corporate money coming in and sponsors and athletes um, you know, making some money. But let's face it, it's not turning into <laughs> these multi-million dollar contracts. And I don't think, I mean, I hope that's what's going to keep the sport as pure and drug free and a bunch of those other worries that I think a lot of people do worry about. But I think in general, it's been positive. Um, it is a little tricky because nowadays there's so much competition for that small amount of money. So I feel like athletes might be maybe doing things that aren't always in their best interest athletically, physically, um, in terms of prolonging their career. So mm -hmm. I'm a big believer in don't stress about sponsorship or feeling that pressure because it's something I think that can drive athletes to some pretty serious overtraining. It seems like there's a half life of a lot of top ultra runners right now in that three to five year window. And for some people, you know, they want to, you know, burn it all up and do as much as they can in that three to five years. And some people want to be in it, uh, long term. And I think longevity is something to to strive for. But that's just my two cents. Well, I think your two cents are worth a lot more than two cents because <laughs> I mean, seven time states champion, hard rock champion, bad water, you, your resume obviously speaks for itself. Uh, and you've been doing this for a long time. You know, you've been able to take your career and turn it into a long time career while staying healthy uh, is, I think, a testament to the mm -hmm. you know longevity being an important aspect of the sport. Um, that's a great question because I. I think it dovetails nicely into kind of where I wanted to start with both of you. And that's just how the sport has changed because you've both been in ultra running. You're both ultra runners and you've been in it uh, for quite some time. I mean, obviously, it's been around for decades and decades, but 
where the sport is now compared to what it where it was in the early 2000s is is pretty dramatically different where have you seen those differences really spike up like where are things shifting or where's the direction going with the sport and is it good is it bad does it have its positives or negatives and i'd love to hear from both of you on this yeah uh, you go first. I, I would say for for me i think one of the biggest things is there's an explosion obviously in this the number of individuals wanting to compete in races so mm-hmm. you do have these premier very popular races um almost being impossible to get in you know for five to seven years some people will will keep applying and keep entering a lottery. And so I think that's probably one of the biggest downfalls of the interest of the sport growing and the sport growing as a whole. Um, We're pretty limited in terms of where we can hold these events. So land agencies that regulate permits, um, we can't just hold an event where we have 2000 runners like the Ultra Trail Tour de Mont Blanc. Um, It's pretty difficult. Um, Leadville gets up there for a hundred miler in terms of numbers, which is, is pretty cool. But you also have the out and back course. So we are kind of, it's not like the sport can grow like marathoning for instance, because of the roads. So I think our biggest issue is how do we do that? And I think the biggest thing is, you know, more events have been created and people have spread themselves throughout the country. Uh, it used to be that, you know, you'd show up for, okay, this was the springtime kind of measure yourself against those in the West and the Rockies and even the East coasters would come out and do early season races, whether it was way too cool or a race like Leona divide 50, um, to gauge themselves for something like Western States 100. So as you've seen the, the races explode both in the U S and internationally, I think that's kind of changing the dynamic. It, it's no longer, I mean, I remember the days when you could literally sign up for a lot of races the night before or, or go to the race and like, right. oh, I'm feeling like racing tomorrow. <laughs> like I'll be like, <laughs> I'll go and run. So um, that's definitely changed and it does feel, but you know, the numbers have gotten bigger, but again, the core, I think of the sport is there. Um, you just don't have like that tight knit community. I think for a lot of people, like they're like, Whoa, who are these people now? And I used to know everybody at the race and they were all my friends. And um, so that's, I guess the, the part that some people are like, Oh no, my sport's changing. And I, you know, I want to hold on to everything, but I think we're going through those growing pains right now. Go ahead, Jenny. Uh- Oh, okay. I mean, the first time I did Chuckanut was maybe like 15 years ago, and mm. there was nothing but old white men doing it. And then coming back, I haven't done it in eight years, and I was just like in a sea of Asian women. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look at me. <laughs> but um, I think there's just more diversity and more women, which is awesome. Um, seeing more African Americans, more like just um a broader range of people, which is awesome. And I do a lot of road running also. And I think the diversity has always been in the 5k half marathons, but it's nice to see it um, in the ultra distance. I, I mean, again, look, we've only been in it for, I guess, seven years. Mm-hmm. And it's been really fascinating to see just the growth of the sport in that short amount of time. So I can only imagine how much it's changed from, you know, the early 2000s and stuff. And Scott, even in your book, there was a moment when you talk about signing up for Western States and you're like, I'm just going to sign up for Western States and go run it. You know, you talk about how you sign up and then you go run it. And I like, I heard that and was like, God, you can't even, you can't even <laughs> like think a 10 about year plan. Yeah, that's a 10 year plan. <laughs> now. If you want to run States, you got a plan for 2025 at this point. Uh, so just hearing that and it wasn't that long ago right and hearing just how different it is now yeah it's go ahead oh that's fine uh i was i was going to ask a a bit of a different question did if you i would love to hear if you had additional thoughts on that no i think that's you know the main thing like jenny said the the cool thing ultra running was setting the trend in terms of women and participation which was really cool and then all of a sudden you saw you know, women's growth in marathoning and other aspects of the sport of running. So ultra marathoning did have, you know, more women than say a marathon. And so that's, that's, that's been really cool to see too. And, you know, I was, you know, back in the day, it was like, there were top, there were women in the top 10 at Western States. I mean, not just one, there were two. And that was pretty cool too. And people can say, oh, it wasn't as competitive back then, but it was really, I think, setting trends of like what women could do in endurance and ultra endurance. And I, I think that was, that was awesome. Especially when you get your butt kicked by Antresen, which I did have the uh, <laughs> pleasure of doing one time. So I think that's, um, that's, what's really cool is that it was this tight knit of uh, r- t- tight knit community, but these individuals that really brought a lot of flavor and uh, excitement to the sport. No doubt. I don't think it would be 
where it is today without that sort of pioneership, right? Like just that that growth of the sport happened in such a way where it, it brought new voices, new faces. Uh, I don't think I would have heard about it had I not heard about your stories from locals here in Seattle. Like it just grew sort of organically. And now it's it's really interesting with the advent in social media and how things are exponentially growing. Uh, mm -hmm. Kim has been in the chat room pulling some amazing <clears throat> live questions. What do we got? Yeah, we were just talking about Western States. There was a question. Um, the question was, Scott, you're a seven time winner of Western States. What makes this race so special that you'd return seven times in a row? And why is it so important to you? For me, it was it was the most competitive 100 mile race in the world at, at, at the time. And if you wanted to race against the best at 100 miles on trails, uh, Western States 100 was the best place to do that. And so we'd all, you know, basically plan our schedules running around you know, Western. Uh, there weren't a lot of 100 milers that build the competition. And also they really kept the competition keen because they would throw in guys and gals, um, like top hundred K runners, for instance, like Rich Hanna, two seventeen marathoner. Um, he was entered into the race, you know, within a month and a half, two months before the race. And there was always that element of, you know, there were some dark horses and it was the race that allowed some of these individuals that they proved their case to uh, race management. There were now like golden tickets back then. It was more like, is this person going to make the race exciting? And sometimes, yeah, they fried at Forest still or, or before, but then it, it changed. Oh, one technical We're going to add thing. some more light. I think that sun, <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to turn on some lights and tell me if it's too much. Yeah, we can or... change the angle. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Do, do Sorry, what you folks. need to do. Oh, it's, okay. it's, <laughs> this is like one of the perks of being alive is that we actually get to see you, famous yeah. people of the sport do normal human things like turn lights on. It's too that We'll Sorry. Get, no, it's we totally bank. fine. Um, yeah, we were banking on uh, the natural light, which makes it the best. Um, and I think that's pretty good, actually. Yeah, it's it still looks great. People are able okay. to see your faces. It's not last week we had a uh, mis mystery guest on. Um, there's an ultra running memes Instagram account, and that person was able to cover their face. For they the did, not reveal, they did face not reveal their face at all. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Our viewers have now seen your face, so they know at least you're real. <laughs> oh, there we go. Me, does that blow it out, or is, is that? that that oh, looks it's fantastic. That's okay. fine. That's great. Right. And Jenny will block that other light. It won't look too much like a halo. Is that okay? <laughs> She's good. There you go. Okay. Uh, it oh, honestly fine. looks yeah. like you're outside during a sunset. It's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, go ahead. Do you have another one? Oh, I was going to say, yeah. maybe before we dive into the book, there's a question for Jenny in the chat room from Erica. Yes. Erica asks, given your background in product design and work for Ultimate Direction, could you comment on one area in women's running gear that you'd like to see improved? Great question. Mm, good good question. I mean, it's actually, I feel like it's gotten a lot better these days. Um, I love, I, I love the pack still and, and not as a personal bias, but I do feel like there's still room to improve on the packs as far as like fitting and sizing and bounce and, um, and kind of where we carry things in regards to like breasts and, mm -hmm. um, and, and just kind of like neck shoulder width and stuff so i still i still feel like there's a little bit more room of, to improve in the packs department jenny always feels like yeah for women i mean clothing i feel like it's yeah dialed but well, i feel like mm -hmm. there's a lot of good clothing out there for sure but there's never anything i'm like super envious of, of like booze like, there's a cool men's pack you know i feel like there's great <laughs> women, female alternatives now for for everything so and they're getting better. I think Jenny, one of Jenny's like pet peeves is when they just want to put pink on it or like women's colors. And like, <laughs> that's funny. Fashion. We've talked about that. So she's a real stickler for function for women and women well, specific. Fit. Like and fit. Fit. Yeah. So there was a term that Kim used on the show. I think uh, I forget if it was last week or two weeks ago, but I the shrink and pink, the shrink and pink, right? Yeah. yeah. Taking a men's product and just shrinking right. it and, and putting pink on it. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's Not terrible. Either. Um, all right. So I, I want to start digging in because this book was awesome um, for I, the main reason that I really, really loved it was that it was told from two perspectives. I think what you were able to do was experience this adventure from two different angles. Of course, Scott running the trail and Jenny being the support system there day in, day out, driving the van, meeting Scott at trailheads and all that sort of thing. Did you know going, well, first, going into this adventure, did you know that you were going to create a book as a result of it? Was there any, 
uh, of course the the intentions of the event or adventure itself were all personal but was there that mindset of like hmm, maybe we'll come up with something as a result of this or was that in the mind at all during it no i would say it wasn't until partway through because i'd been working on uh, ideas for a second book and they just weren't gelling i partly wasn't spending enough time on it <laughs> just because sitting down and writing a book was not sounding that appealing so we went on the trip, not even thinking about any of that. In fact, we didn't think about a lot of things <laughs> as we wrote about and don't want to ruin it, but um, we were prepared enough. So the idea of actually writing things down as it was happening, because everyone assumes you must have journaled, you must have, oh. there was just no time. And so mm -hmm. it wasn't really until halfway through when um, my literary agent was like, sending a message in January, my like, Hey, you might want to read this email. Um, so I was reading it and he was like, Hey, this adventure might be a good idea to do that next book you're talking about. And, you know, we thought about it, but in terms of like thinking more beyond that, there wasn't a whole lot of energy put into that at all. So Jenny, for you having all, I don't want to say that you had free time every day, but <laughs> like yeah. Tons of free time. Tons. Uh, tons. Of free time. Like, <laughs> it's like hanging uh, out spas and. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just, yeah. Like, living the dream. Living the dream uh, in, in a van in the middle of nowhere in some places. Uh, were you able to write any of this stuff down? Or, I mean, at that point, it wasn't a book. It wasn't a seed for a book or anything like that. But was there any sort of documentation in your mind or journaling of some sort to. The reason I'm asking this is because the book does a really great job of sort of linearly taking through uh, taking us through this very long experience uh 44 plus days and and you you feel like you're a part of the journey day after day after day after day so i'm curious if you were able to document that in some way just for yourself at some point i know i wish i was but really the only way that i documented it and the things that like would trigger our memories was we had a guidebook and it had like the mile markers and then I would just highlight like, oh, we stopped here, 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 and here, and like on this day. So I kind of had this like mileage, um, not a journal, but just like a memory trigger. And then just photos from the iPhone is like, oh yeah, that's where we did this and that. Um, and then also my gazetteers, my maps, I had circled like the meeting places. And so then I could be like, oh, that's where we crossed this river. That's where we were at this mountain. And then just to have a steel trap memory too. So <laughs> and Jenny does. Yeah. That was kind of that. Um, I kind of held, tried to hold it all together because I didn't think we were going to write a book or anything, but <coughs> it was, I, I mean, the trail is so lush and vivid that like everything kind of triggers all these memories and feelings and emotions. And, and we had a lot of people out there who also would write in or like some of our friends took really good notes and mm. at the end when we were both kind of loopy like our friend kim gaylord she had great notes of everything that happened mm. and so we're like oh yeah okay so even six months later she was like able to regurgitate like, oh, that to we us. called this person and that person i'm like oh yeah okay. <laughs> we wish we had done something it's like I we didn't save a voicemail from... my biggest regret is all the cool trail names all the people the through hikers we met had the best trail names and i always wanted to remember their trail names but that was the hard thing, yeah. yeah. But the, it was, like Jenny said, it was so raw and emotional that thankfully I, we have good memories, but it was easy to insert our, like, mind and, like, cognitive abilities and emotions around those, like, instances and events. And we knew, like, okay, these are the most important things because so many things happen over 46 days and 50 right. miles. Mm -hmm. It's, like, mind-boggling. But it's it was also good because the things that we remembered most, not all of them made it in the book, but they were the ones who were like, oh, this has to be in the book. Whereas I think if we had written down journals, we might have wanted to like put too much. And this book was not meant to be a trip report. It was meant to be a book for somebody who's not a runner, not a hiker, um, as well as somebody who's maybe interested in endurance and, and things like that. So we didn't want it to be a trip report. So it was, I think, to our advantage in a way. But you have to have a good memory, too. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like that it's not a George R.R. R. Martin like series of epic yeah. novels and stuff like that. That's, that's another one of the first things I noticed was just how approachable it was. Uh, as an ultra runner, I was getting tons out of the specific uh, references, trail talk, all the terminology that we use in ultra running that was so familiar and just the descriptions and the stories. But also someone listening to it who has never run an ultra, 
could easily grasp onto the emotions and the mm -hmm. adventure. Um, totally. One thing I really, really love. Let's get to a live question because there's tons. Yeah, there's a question and comment from Jameson in the chat room. Jameson says, whose idea was the was to have the book have two views of your AT record and experience? It was a great idea and made for a very interesting read. Agreed. Whose idea was it? I feel like it was Scott's idea because um, we both read a lot and I really liked that book, Gone Girl. And then he read it and... And then also that book, Touching the Void, you know, there was two perspectives. And Scott was just kind of, when he first started thinking about it, like, there's no way I can really tell the story without being like, and then I got here and Jenny said this and Jenny did that. and Jenny, Because it would be really boring if he told it for me. So he was kind of like, I think you should inject your own parts. And I was reading, like Jenny said, we had read Gone Girl or way earlier, but I was also reading a uh, girl on a train or girl, the girl on the train. Mm -hmm. And again, one, you know, it's another thriller. Like I like to read mindless fiction, much like people like that. Sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah. Um, I also read heavy stuff too, but it's nice to just like dig into a mindless. I think that's why yeah, Netflix and all these TV shows are so popular. So sometimes I read those books, but it wasn't like, I'm going to write that kind of book, obviously. Um, but the two perspectives kind of key. stuck out. Less. But a funny thing is our editor really fought against it for quite a while until she oh. she went against on and Jenny and I really had to prove to her that we could pull this off. Um, she was really she really thought there was another one. She's been editing for 25 years. Right. She thought instead of like having my own designated spots, it, they could maybe like italicize my part, just like inject it like a couple paragraphs here and there instead of at the end. Cause it was kind of tricky for me to not repeat everything he just said, oh, you know, sure. mm -hmm. and the drama has the drama has to like the different things that happen had dovetail. I mean, there's a little overlap occasionally, but it was really hard to be like, Oh, now, you know, we, we still need to finish a chapter, but it'd be hard. Like otherwise Jenny would come in more often. And so that was the tricky part as writers. Um, and we're, you know, we didn't go to school to write or anything like that. So that was like for us um, quite hard. But in the end, our editor was like really pleased and really I'm happy. I'm glad you guys. I mean, yeah, and I'm glad. I'm glad people do like it because Jenny's story, I think, couldn't have been told from another voice. And she's got a her own sense of humor, and uh, she can get away with uh, telling stories in a different fashion than I can. And I think that's what makes it so unique. Well, it would be great because like. <laughs> Jenny would say something, uh, Scott came in, sat down, and this happened. And you'd be like, what happened? And then Scott's voice would pick up and kind of backtrack a little bit and like, oh, I ran in, sat down, and then this happened. You kind of relive these moments from two different <clears throat> perspectives that there's a bit of overlap. Um, I don't know. It, I loved it because it was different than any other. When you start talking about trail running books or uh, anything in that realm, they're either very scientific or educational, mm -hmm. teaching you how to do a certain thing or at least giving you inspiration or coaching habits or guidance. Uh, this is story driven, right? And that's one thing that I really loved about it was that it was a story told by two people who were living it in real time. And you were able to, I mean, you easily could have done two different books and they would have been equally as engaging, but being able to bring them together uh, was fascinating. And I thought it was really great well, as an ultra you. runner who has a wife who has <laughs> crewed and paced me through countless things and vice versa. You know, there's always two sides to every story. Yeah, I, I really loved hearing uh, Jenny's side of things and like the emotions and the feelings behind it. And it was, I thought that was really uh, uh truthful. We're sitting there going, yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm think like, we, uh huh. We were driving. Uh -huh. so, again, I, I don't want this to sound like just a giant advertisement. That's, that's not what the <laughs> point of the show is. But the reason we loved the audiobook was because hearing your voices did a lot to sort of put us in place and, and location. Uh, and then this is inevitably what happens with books that are on tape is that they read other character parts in those voices. Uh, I have to commend Scott on his Carl Meltzer impression. Uh, <laughs> I can. Really it's obvious you spent a lot of time with that guy. But read the first book. So it was fun. And we had some great yeah, accents and we had fun with it, even though we were burnt on the material. Um, Jenny, I haven't. Jenny and I haven't listened to the audiobook, but um, <laughs> but I know he recorded. He does, I know he does a good speako. He always does. He yeah. always so, has. Yeah, we have we had a lot of fun with that. So that was like the most fun, and I think for people, yeah, who do know these characters of the sport, it's fun for them to to see how we interpret and impersonate them. And um, supposedly Wait. Carl was pretty happy. Like we didn't. We that didn't. was my next question. <laughs> I was like, what did he think? Yeah. 
he he has a lot of coaching clients that are like, dude, you have to listen to the audio book because Scott nails it. But um, have you guys had Speed Code on your shelf? We have. Oh, okay. I'm sure, yeah, somewhere yeah, online. So you know. Yeah, he was episode, <laughs> like, who even can remember at this point? No, uh, like, he was practiced for this one. He was the big practice. <laughs> I'm, I'm just hearing Scott do the impression and hearing Jenny do the impression was, I think, the most brilliant part because they both do a great Carl Meltzer impression. That is worth the audiobook alone. <laughs> yeah, because there's this... a there's a lot of people in the chat room that did, in fact, listen to the audiobook, mm -hmm. and um, everybody's agreeing. Like they just loved hearing uh, both your voices and then along with uh, the voices of all the other characters in yeah. the book, essentially. It the book also reads as kind of a who's who of ultra running. I mean, you have appearances by some of the greats, the people who have really laid down some of the biggest, stoutest records. And mm -hmm. was that something you knew going into this attempt on the AT that you were going to incorporate as many of these friends of yours, obviously, but these experienced names in the sport? Did you want to try to bring in as many people or was it a byproduct of the extremes that you went through? It was it was actually sheer luck in a way. I mean, we had some friends who said, yeah, we're kind of come out and, but we didn't have it as organized. And that's where when things were a little, I guess, um, you know, for Jenny to be by herself all in the South, that was really right. hard. And I think one of the biggest things was being my, myself, I felt really guilty that, you know, I'm leaving her out there and this is when we should have had friends come out and we wanted to be by ourselves for a couple of weeks in the beginning and just have our, our own time. But right. um, I did kind of, not plan things. And then speak out was a total, like that was just, he didn't even know about it. I mean, I mean, I know Carl, <laughs> I really didn't want to, I really wanted to respect his turf. Um, and that's sure. something like that's an old school, um, even in this modern day of, you know, everyone knows everything about everyone with social media. Um, Carl and I, I could just had a ton of respect. It was like, it was his baby. And then I didn't want to be like mining him, but the fact that he did come out was awesome. And Hordy, said he was going to come out at some point at least once or twice and i knew he couldn't help himself and then him coming out a bunch of times like we also because you know he's like you know you love him and hate him half the time <laughs> he's like <laughs> um so we really didn't know like the cast of characters um but i think that's what like an ultra is all about in an ultra marathon is right. you have these different personalities and sometimes you pick somebody to be on your crew and you're like why the hell did i do that like that was stupid um, but they added so much to the experience and that's where it was like this thing of like, we brought new people and we hadn't even heard of before. Um, right. and so when you said we brought in some of the, you know, the greats of the sport, but we also brought in these like local, um, badasses, so to speak, like, you know, Tristan and Ryan Welts and, you know, his wife, Christina, like Andrew Drummond and these people who didn't really, who weren't really known outside of the Northeast. And I think that's what was really cool is that they lend, they came out to lend a hand, like just on their own. And it was really cool. And the trail running clubs up in the Northeast and Maine, um, it was just really neat to, to have that dynamic. But then we had like our A team that we were hoping to come out. But then at the end, um, Topher, Chrissy and Kim, like that was a last minute, like, gosh, we really need you guys. Um, yeah. And I don't ruin, ruin things for the book or have any spoilers, but it really was just luck and it was an adventure that way. And I think that's what made it so, I don't know, just made it an unreal experience, like one of those life changing experiences. So yeah, don't plan who your crew is going to be to like, <laughs> <laughs> the best advice. I love that. I you love heard that. it here. Yeah. Just don't plan anything. It'll all happen. Uh, we'll get to another live question here in a second, but of course I wanted to uh, kind of touch on what you, you mentioned a little bit earlier about Jenny, essentially you were on your own for a lot of it out there. And, you know, this book sort of plays out in a way where it gets rough from the start for Scott. Uh, and then it starts to balance out a little bit, but then it starts to get rough for you. It feels like uh, on those backcountry roads and, and just sort of stuff happening off the trail. Uh, and then everything kind of goes chaotic towards the end with, with Scott getting so close and going through all that. So Jenny, for you, were there times that you legitimately felt, uh, unsafe or like that risk alone was that difficult for you to continue on we know that scott hit places where he was questioning his ability to continue on Did that ever cross your mind from a whole different perspective 
I mean, I'm not like an alarmist. I'm not. I feel like I'm pretty independent. But there were a couple times in the times that I write about in the book where I did feel like this is not a good idea. There were three specific ones that I can think of. But a lot of times it would just be like when I'm driving for three hours at night and I am out of cell range and have no idea like if he's going to come. It's like pouring rain. And it's kind of like way back in the day before cell phones when you could just be like, oh, ping me when you get there. We had to stick to a plan and I had to stay there because I said I would be there even. Okay. And so I always felt like even I did a couple of times feel compromised. Like I don't want to be here, but I have to be here because if I, I'm his lifeline. So, um, but it was only a few times. And, and again, like I know that trails are like so safe and the people who, go on trails are like the friendliest people. And I'm not, I'm not saying, Oh, I felt sketchy, but I just didn't know the area. I didn't know, you know, it's, it wasn't my hood. I had like no connection. I right. didn't really know um, what to expect. So I, you know, I wrote as honest as I could. And I don't, I, I know some people from the South are like, Oh, she makes it sound like the South is like full of the boogeyman. But I legit felt scared in a couple of places. And that's probably just because I didn't really know where I was and I didn't know the situation. Like, I don't know. But Well, and, you know, when again, I, I grew up total redneck in the backwoods of Minnesota, but we're talking about way back there. And this is why when people do comment like, well, you guys write about the South as, as, as if it's Boogeyman. But I mean, there's a fair amount of media that has people scared. I mean, you see Confederate flags like flying out in the middle of nowhere everywhere. And whether it's just, you know, an act of defiance or, you know, or pride or just, just yeah, like, pride and don't yeah. tread on me. We write about that. But, you know, I get it. Like these people feel very strongly. But when you're, you know, again, somebody who's an ethnic minority like Jenny is, you're out in the middle of nowhere. Like, yeah, it's scary. You're a woman. Um, and I think that is scary. But I, that's the other thing is there's so many warm people and 99.9 <laughs> of those percent of those people would have helped her. But she did have a few things. And when those few things happen early on it does sketch you out. Like I would be on the trail and I would be worried about certain things just by, you know, the fog and like, you know, it gets creepy out there. And when you're by yourself, um, Jenny was just as sleep deprived as I was. Um, you know, and that's, that's, but again, that's part of adventure. And, you know, we both survived really well and we would tell people to do this tomorrow in a heartbeat. Like we would tell people this was an amazing experience and you should never fear. Um, but it does come in the back of your mind quite often. And I think that's what we tried to write about too, because, um, it wasn't just this book of like, oh, we, you know, everything went well from the start. We really tried to write, I don't know, just the things that we like were, were feeling at that moment. doesn't mean like we feel that all the time. As, as Jenny said, it wasn't Atlanta or it wasn't Raleigh, Durham, <laughs> where we were hanging out. Like it was, it was, it was like deep, 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 <laughs> deep <south. laughs> or deep woods. And uh, even in the Northeast, I mean, there's, you know, it's not the South. I mean, the Northeast has, you know, a fair amount of like, you know, you can get in trouble in a lot of places if you run into the wrong people. But the moral of the story is everybody was cool. And most, I mean, I think it's just like humanity wants to help and be nice and be friendly. So that was awesome. I, the reason I asked that is because both Kim and I have been to some pretty remote areas in, in the South and had similar experiences. Mm -hmm. I'm, we're hearing Jenny talk about him and Scott during the book and kind of sitting there also nodding our heads like, yeah, we've had a similar mm -hmm. experience overwhelmingly outweighed by positive experiences. I don't want mm -hmm. yes. that. To, I, I know you guys are in that same boat. Uh, and there are plenty of places on the West Coast where things get dicey. Uh, <laughs> Northern California. It's a little scary. Um, so yes, I just wanted to allow you to clarify a little bit on that because oh, that was one of those things that helped us or not helped us, but got to us because we're just mm -hmm. kind of like, oh my God, that reminds us of that one time. Yeah. Uh, and it like just goes to your head. And I think that's that's the mind, especially when you're sleep deprived of an ultra runner or somebody oh, who's yeah. and like you just your emotions are like running sky high as it is and just adds another element to it. So um and when you're with someone that you love and you're separated by time and mm -hmm. mileage and you're both so remote, it's <laughs> you turn that emotion up to eleven or twelve. It's 
because you, you're close, but yet you're so far and there's so much between, like, I get it. I totally get yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Jenny wasn't, you know, the help was not going to come for like hours. And so when you're out in the middle of nowhere and again, she just had to place that trust. And I think that's what was so um, amazing about the experience too, is that we were both trusting and I was trusting that she was going to be there. And I mean, it was amazing. Like she really had a perfect record the whole time, which was pretty phenomenal. There was, I you know, we mentioned two little twice. times. Yeah. I missed him twice, but, but. It's uh, that's not easy to do. One was Luis Escobar's. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk it's about crazy. that one. You know, like, <laughs> Carl had driven the trail just from a crewing standpoint, like one spring, just drove the entire trail, and just to know where the best spots to crew for. So like, for just Jenny for fun, and not I, actually not crewing with someone. There. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's oh, awesome. sorry. Yeah. Was... So he drove it just to just to test it out, like not to actually crew someone, but to just. Just to, no, just to just to like recon the trail crossings. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> yeah, <No>. exactly. So, <laughs> that's uh, again, we are live with Scott and Jenny Jurek. Kim has pulled aside a lot of these wonderful questions. Uh, what do we got? There's a really funny question in the chat room, and I have to ask it because I think it's hilarious. A uh, question from Ingen. Ingen says, question for the Jurek's. What kind of magical book is keeping your kid quiet for this long? <laughs> <laughs> it's a stack of about 20. And what's she reading right now? Oh, she's just eating a cookie I gave her. So bad parenting. It's like way past bedtime, but she's, yeah, she's kind of just happy with a cookie and a headlamp. And a little book. <laughs> Ladybug girl books. And uh, yeah, she's really into a train book. So it's a good, good question. <laughs> A uh, question from Nathaniel in the chat room. Nathaniel says, uh, Scott, you've described running as a vehicle for self-discovery. What about yourself did running help you discover? And what do you think others can learn about themselves by running? It's the million dollar question. Um, I, I still feel like I'm searching for that answer. And I'm still searching for um, what I tried to do with North was to get at elements of it without telling somebody like, if you run you know, 2,200 miles on the Appalachian Trail, here's what you're going to find. Um, I give little glimpses of it, but it's really a difficult thing. I think when somebody says to you like, oh, how did you change? And I talk a lot about transformation. Uh, I think ultra running events and ultra endurance is a great way to not just um, explore oneself, but oneself, but to transform oneself. And what happens after I don't know if it's important that it's articulated, but you just know, um, you can just feel that something is different. And I wish I could, again, like I try to do this in writing. I racked my brain, you know, for two years writing this book, trying to figure it out. And that's why I think I keep going back. So I think the answer is, um, you, you have to, you have to get into those places before you can actually find, um, I wish I could bottle it up and give that magic potion to the, um, Nathaniel or whoever uh, asked that question, because it's, uh, it's not something that, and that's what I love about it. You, it it's different for everybody. You, you can't just read a book and like, okay, I'm going to be an ultra runner or I'm transformed because I read a book. You might get some inspiration and therefore then go on your own journey. Um, it, it's much like a vision quest, I think for a lot of people. And for me, that's the way I, I, I call it, um, it's like I'm going on my own vision quest and it just, something happens out there and you got to go to the real dark places. And that's why I'm sure people wouldn't really read the book. It's like, it got really dark many times and there was a lot of joy though too. And I think that's that, that wonderful trip we all go on. There's some great chapters, uh, towards the end where you, like you do a great job of describing those dark passages, those areas where your mind goes, where things become impossible. And you're, you're like, you're kind of in a hypnosis where you're moving forward, but you're not really moving at all. And it, it's getting through those chapters were really difficult for me, uh, uh, kind of from like an emotional standpoint, because uh, I've done long distance runs before. And I know that I've gotten to that point. And so like, I start thinking about what it would be at mile 2000. <laughs> and how much deeper that must have been. And it's right. really difficult to, to picture that. So I get, you know, one thing I really wanted to ask both of you, I guess, is we're learning about this sort of in real time and publicly is running, not letting running define who we are and, and you know, but not make our choices because of running, but allow running to continue to support us and be fun and part of the joy of our life. 
both of you have made wonderful careers out of the sport um, and still seem to eat, breathe, live, sleep, running. How are you able to balance all of this? You know, take your adventures, uh, enjoy a 2200 mile Appalachian Trail attempt, uh, attempt um, while also maintaining regular lives. Like, how are you able to balance that now? Because it's so different now, for, I'm imagining for you, than it was 10 years ago. Yeah, I think part of it is I always had to um, early on because I couldn't just be a professional runner, right? Like I trained as if running was, you know, a professional um, avenue for me, but mm. um, I always had to have a job. And so I think that prepared me to have balance. And I think that's why I had such a long career and continue to still want to do some things, even though they're a little different, like the Appalachian Trail. Um, but I would say one thing, if you want to learn how to like put things in perspective or balance, have kids, <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like, what did we do to ourselves? Like, you know, cause we are trying to like, you know, and it slowed us down. It's taken, like, there's times where I'm like, okay, I'm just going to go on a different type of run. I'm going to push the jogger and, you know, I have 50 pounds of kids and, um, and it's not going to be perfect. So you get more creative and more appreciative, but there are those moments, you know, when Raven's out. And she's just wanting to look at little things that I didn't even look at. And that perspective, I think, is really cool. So um, the, the key is, I think, for anything is to be flexible, be adaptable. And I think that's what ultra running teaches everyone. You have to be adaptable and find a way to maintain balance. And I guess you let some things go. And for me, I, I've never had this luxury where or felt this luxury where like running is everything. You know, I have my massage therapy appointments and I have an appointment with say a coach or a nutritionist and it's just never been that way. I've had to like figure things out as I've gone along and making it a lifestyle. So I think for people who want to maybe, I don't know if they want to emulate what we've been doing because I think we have the answers. <laughs> yeah. Um, cause the next trip is going to be difficult, um, with two kids. Um, yeah, things are going to get tight in the, the old van, uh, so to speak. Um, so we're going to have to figure things out, but it's, it's definitely something where I don't know if I could have done what we're doing with children 15 years ago, 20 years ago, um, or it would have been really different, um, in a lot of ways. So, you know, working a full-time job, having two kids, um, under the age of two, that would have been, uh, I don't know, that would have been a recipe for something breaking. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's the key is like getting to the breaking point without actually, you know, causing things to permanently break, whether it's your body relationships or, um, you know, just that balance of, of everyday life. So I don't know. I, Jenny maybe has a comment too. I mean, I don't know. I just think having kids late kind of helped because we got to do everything we wanted to do. Mm. I mean, not everything. We did a lot of things. And then it's kind of easier to like slow down and have a little more family time right now. And not stressing about things too. I mean, I, I've learned that I thought sleep de deprivation was like next level on the Appalachian Trail, but having <laughs> kids and trying to keep everything like what, you know, the work commitments and, you know, just all the different aspects that I have to keep juggling, um, just like yeah, making dinner so I can get on the show here, um, feeding kids, like it's just always a balancing act. And I think you just learn to, you either embrace it and then there's those times where you're just like, what am I doing here? You know, why do <laughs> it's, it's just like running a, an ultra marathon. You have those same thoughts. And so I think you just have to take everything, try to have fun, get through the difficult stuff and just embrace everything that happens. Are you guys going to have kids? Uh, we have a small <laughs> dog and that is, uh, that is the exact same thing. <laughs> Totally. We, I mean, we've talked about it, but uh, we haven't talked about it on the air, Jenny. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry, I'm just like looking at you guys, and I'm like, ooh, Asian babies are the cutest. So. We, we've we're done, starting with a dog. Yeah, we're starting with the dog. <laughs> okay. um, we're in the dog phase. But we have done that Photoshop thing, taking picking oh, our faces. Yeah, and, it's yeah, it's terrifying. It's terrifying. You don't want to see the <laughs> see the result. Uh, it looks like our dog, and that's what's terrifying. <laughs> Um, you brought up cramming everyone in the van. Is there another adventure in the works? Is there a return to the AT? Are you allowed to talk about it? I used <laughs> I used to think that going back to the AT, because I think what Jenny and I would like to do is probably go back to the AT when the kids are older and oh, yeah. do it as a family or something. But she was kind of like one and done. I have I had these dreams after like, gosh, we could like do things so much better and like I'm going down to help speed goat right. and helping him the last 10 days. I was just, Oh, everything could get dialed. And not that it would be a different experience, but it would just, um, 
you know, it's the, it's the competitive side of me coming through. And I talk about this in North again, this book is for people who are kind of in that spot, whether it's young or old and they're wondering, okay, am I following the right path? Um, how do you get that mojo back? How do you get that drive? Um, when the grind seems like it's getting you down and, Mm -hmm. Um, that's where the AT I think was helpful. It was like, okay, how can I, so my brain went back to the, you know, two thousands Western States, Scott Jurek of figuring everything out. What can I do to improve and, and get a little faster in the AT? Um, despite those We're difficulties. We're not going back though. So, We're not going back. <laughs> something else, right. yeah. something else. So yeah. there's it, so much to see, so much to do. I'm like, yeah. that's there. so, um, he's, I mean, he has these things that he's always wanted to do. And I'm like, I guess if that's what you want to do, then we're going to do that. But, um, TBD. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's we'll wait. Something's going to happen. I and mean, I'm hoping late this year, early next year in that time frame, or maybe spring. So <laughs> stay tuned. Uh, just like the AT, uh, I like to keep people like, I want to give out everything and, and talk about it too much beforehand. We just like to go out and do things. Which is code for he hasn't planned it yet. But <laughs> it's in the it's in the inspiration phase for sure. Yeah. It's incubating and incubating. yeah. <laughs> I'm just watching Jenny's faces, and those are all faces I've made at but you as you're like telling people what if our we plans. Did this, and I'm like, and what if we like I, made our plans? Yeah. What if- <laughs> I know. I'm we're like, gonna. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay. <laughs> we're gonna rewatch this, uh, and just like just watch Jenny's faces. Like, oh, okay, there's a turn. Oh, there's something new. Um, it's it's brilliantly insightful. Um, but I'm like I'm always really curious, and I know Scott, you've done so many interviews and and countless conversations with journalists and stuff like that about the book and your career and everything like that. And I hate that question of what's next, right? Like we ask it on the show of a lot of our guests because we're always curious what they're doing next. So I appreciate you even um, answering that as cryptically as you can. And no, uh, and it's an important question and I'm not trying to hide things, but um, next is like right now. And I know it's not sexy and exciting because people who are tuning in or listening uh, later, it's one of those things like, yeah, they want to know what's happening. Cause we're always, we, you know, we want to know what's down the road and, and what people are going to do. And, um, like, I'm just really psyched right now where I'm at, even though there is a burning, yeah, there's a desire to do something else potentially, um, sometime soon, but I guess, you know, having the kids, I don't want to say it's caused me to just become slower and live life. Um, but it's really brought out different aspects. And, and I was content. This is the, the sad thing about the Appalachian Trail before we went out. I really try to get at this, that I was in a good spot. Like I was totally fine not competing hard and letting that go. But Jenny would see like, I'd, sometimes I'd be like, oh, I just, maybe, maybe I still have it. Or maybe I want to go back to those places. And it's like, how do you go back to the difficult things that right. we know are good for us? But when life is pretty good on the couch and um, not to say my life is busy, but like there's those times where I'm like, yeah, it's nice to just go for two hours instead of five hours today out for a run or it's, yeah, just being like psyched on life right now. And that, that's a hard thing sometimes. And that's where I think mm-hmm. burnout, I saw, I've seen so many of my friends, whether they get injured over the years yeah. and they don't even hardly run much or they run very little. And I feel like for me, I want to still have that enough of a drive to get out and run with my buddies and say, let's get out for three hours or let's go and do something crazy um, and be fit enough and, and be happy enough. I I love hearing that because we've had other guests on the show. We've had that same question and, and very similar answers, you know, of wanting to dive back into the competitive edge and like what happened to that people who were competitive 10 years ago and that sort of thing. And I love that it's it's less about that and more about like what you just said, loving life, like just enjoying life where you are, but who knows where the next door opens and Mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Um, It's something that Kim and I have talked a lot about on this show and with each other of just where are those joy factors? Where are the things that give us the most joy and, and trying to capture things from our past that gave us joy doesn't always mean that it's going to be joyful again. And Really? Yeah, definitely. Same conversation we've, mm-hmm. we've, we've had it a dozen times, except I did not win Western States seven <laughs> times. Uh, was, it, was it eight? Oh, it was, oh, oh, was six. Okay, okay, good. We, we got to get on the same page with this. Um, it's, um, and that's where it's, too, I think for a lot of people, just finding their own version of an Appalachian Trail. Like, for me, it really brought, not the competitive side of it, but, like, just being psyched of, like, oh, look at the progress I've, you know, covered, and, and look what I've done today, like, that was just sometimes, even though it was like this total roller coaster every day, like 
there was so much fun in being to see like, whoa, we're already into Virginia or we're, you know, we're moving, even though day after day after day, it was like bricklaying and just grunt work all day long. But there was really those moments where I was like, wow, this is, this is so cool. This is exciting. And that's, that's what I hope to instill in our children is just being out there and having fun and finding fun in those really difficult times and not so much where there's a reward or there's like this, you know, this PR or something that we're chasing. Like it's good to have those to push us to those far places or those edges. But I think it's also be like, enjoy what's happening today. And there was a lot of those on the AT, despite all the the suffering that we write about and the, the hard times for Jenny and, and the, the, yeah, it's, there's a lot of cool stuff out there. Well, we really appreciate you both opening the door uh, and taking us a bit on this adventure with you. I know any time that I've relived like Cascade Crest, for example, trying to relive that <laughs> whole day out on the mountains is like, there's foggy memories and everything like that. So thank you for taking us on a wonderful journey, living some of those memories um, heading north, uh, especially from both your perspectives. Oh, oh go ahead. Cascade Crest was my first hundred. And then, and I love the Northwest. Weren't you guys going to ask us about the Northwest? Oh, we are. Like, oh. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm just having so much fun talking that I'm okay. forgetting that the sh like, I want, I don't want to keep you longer than we have you. You have some extra minutes? Yeah. Oh, we yeah. Can do we more. have extra. I mean, she's good. We're good. So. Good. So let's do, uh, let's do some giveaways because I know that you've been very, very gracious. Okay. So Scott right. and Jenny, uh, you have some uh, paperbacks, softbacks. Let's do three. <laughs> okay. Let's three. do three. 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 Uh, do you? How many bottles do you have as well? Um. Yeah, we can do three. We can do three hydro flask engraved with a white blaze and the little North logo from our book. Awesome. So here's what we're gonna do. We have three questions. Mm -hmm. The the correct answers will get a book and a bottle. So we'll have three whoa, whoa, prizes. Whoa, whoa. whoa. Okay. Is that, so like a. So That's we'll good. just do three yeah. books, yeah. each with a bottle. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Cool. So here's how this works. We do giveaways on the show uh, from time to time. Tonight is kind of a special one because we'll be getting books and bottles directly from the Jurex, which is kind mm -hmm. of a big deal. Uh, we ask a trivia question. The first correct answer in the chat room, according to what both Kim and I see, uh, this also is replayable. So if you come back and go, hey, I, I had the first correct answer, replay the official YouTube video. You'll see the live chat happens room. Happens every time. Happens every time. <laughs> Uh, so what we do is we get that first correct answer, and then we will have you email us at thegingerrunner at gmail, and we will get you uh, the prizes and stuff like that. We'll, we'll figure that all out after the show. So here's how this works. We've got our trivia questions already uh, laid out. We'll ask it, and uh, we'll wait for the first correct answer. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I'll talk to Jenny and Scott while we're waiting for that answer about the Pacific Northwest, which I've been excited about. So here it comes trivia question number one. What was the van name of the van that Scott and Jenny used for the ATFKT. What was the name of their van that they... And I specifically didn't mention it. Yes. As Excellent. Same. Yeah, I think we all did that. <laughs> so while I... Uh, Kim, you are in the chat room there? I'm in the chat room here. Yes. Great. So Jenny and Scott, I am super curious. Uh, we now live back up in the Northwest. We grew up here, but we moved back to Seattle two years ago to to rejoin the trail uh community here and put this place we already have it yep <laughs> oh my gosh that was really fast so pause the question the correct answer came to us from uh i have it in mine as ingen that's who i have yep congratulations ingen a local local runner, local runner here as well yeah. uh, she was nice. on, on tiger mountain this last weekend actually yep. oh awesome hey. the correct answer was what was it, Jenny and Scott? Oh, it's not like a friend of yours that you seeded the answers to. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but what was the correct answer? Oh, Castle Black. Castle Black. Yes. Castle Black. It's a reference. Brilliant. It's a Game of Thrones reference. And um, new season starts next week. <laughs> <laughs> but, and it is black. So, it is And it black. was our, it was our we do, fortress. We do have a little Jon Snow figurine as our little <laughs> post AT. commander. Yeah, so. That's pretty great. Do you still have the van? We oh, still yeah. do. It's yeah. still perked out front. Yeah. <laughs> Sweet. Dirty have you been right in now. it since the AT? Um, oh, oh, yeah. yeah. Many, times. Okay. Many, okay. many trips. And so that's what's kind of fun right now. Yeah. Is but taking we the actually kids. like put windows and a fan and some ventilation. So it's a lot more cozy, but we're... Now we have two car seats in it, so it's kind of... It's 
it's gone through some major remodels. Yeah, (laughs) that's that's awesome work. But yeah, it's going to be hard to get rid of. Like, yeah, Jenny and I are like, we can't get rid of it, even though it's tiny. So. Uh, okay. I'll ask the second trivia question. And, and then, then you can get back into, back into van <laughs> yeah. talk. Is like, no, the, Northwest. Oh, talk. Northwest. <laughs> uh, second trivia question. What was Scott Jurek's trail name? Scott Jurek's trail name. First correct okay. answer. Ingen, you are no longer eligible. <laughs> uh, first correct answer gets the second book and bottle. Uh, so, yes, yeah, Pacific Northwest roots. Um, what did you love about the Northwest? Do you miss the Northwest? Is is it something that uh, you would move back to someday? What, what's, what's your Northwest connection? I, it was such a great place for me for 11 years. And I had done an internship out in Seattle. Those you are familiar with my um, first book. I mentioned that. And it just really, I don't know. There was just this, I mean, I never pictured living in a big city. Never thought I'd live somewhere like Capitol Hill. But there was something that I just really enjoyed and the rain didn't bother me. Um, although after living in Colorado now, it's like, <laughs> it's so much life is pretty easy when you don't have to go out and it's 40 degrees and right. pouring down. Rain. But um, it really, just everything, the, the vibe of the city, um, the grunge culture was still somewhat present. There was just like, I don't know, just like that Seattle vibe. And every time we go back, we're like, oh, it's changed like a lot of people. And it's like, yeah. oh, it's never the same. But um, Jenny would move back in a heartbeat. But after getting used to the sun here in Colorado, um, I'd still like it. I don't know if I could handle Seattle, but. No, I still feel like the Pacific Northwest and specifically Seattle is like my spirit home. Like Mm -hmm. I, something about it on like a molecular level, like I go there and I feel fresh and lush and um, I just feel at home. I love the trails there the best. Like they're so squishy and just, so green and everything's alive and you know here it's so seasonal like right now it's really brown everything's muddy there's right. no leaves so i just love the northwest and i don't mind so many i don't mind winter so we're getting a little bit of everything here in colorado but seattle i did miss like getting those cold snaps and it really being winter but um yeah in the trail community too out there it was really cool to see it grow and just some great yeah. friends, but I think that could happen anywhere. And I think it was just one of those landing spots that everything, you know, coalesced. And it was great. The, the trails were great. Sea level. Sometimes I miss sea level. <laughs> uh, altitude can be great, but I feel like my best workouts, even when I moved here in 2010, I was like, gosh, this is really, you know, I just felt different. And I'm like, man, I wish I could go back and you know, do some outside repeats to gauge my fitness right now. Like I just felt things were a little off or I couldn't really quite gauge myself as well. Um, moving to altitude, not spending time. So there were a lot of like benefits that in, you know, 20 minutes away, you could be on peaks that year round that had 3000 feet of vertical. And it, it's really a, a special place. I'm a donut person too. And before we started dating, I was like, top pot was my jam. So I definitely <laughs> missed donuts there because there's zero here in boulder we oh. ate a top pot maple bar last, last night, night. <laughs> <laughs> that was our sunday dinner yeah um yeah you uh well, first we got a correct answer yes uh oh. lou matos lou matos, matos. congratulations uh scotch Yay. jerk's trail name was web walker web walker which oh so, yeah and i, I got it, it in uh, new york by another uh, through hiker and I went by El Venado for most of the trip, but he was like, you know what, man? Well, he's like, well, we've been calling you web walker. And I didn't really know. And he's like, you're, you're breaking spider webs in the morning and at night because I was basically going, you know, sometimes 20 hours a day, sometimes 18 hours a day. And, and spider webs are a real thing on the Appalachian trail. I never felt that in the Northwest, but because we get so much rain to knock them down, but right. the AT it's pretty serious. Those spiders, um, because the trees are so close, they're like up before you know it, like no time at all. So it was pretty cool. And it was again, good name. Good name. I was yeah, you, your whole chapter on critters talking about critters on the AT gave it was just like, oh man, rattlesnakes and ticks and yeah. spiders and all these crazy things. Ticks. Oh, ticks. Yeah. Yeah. All ticks. the ticks. Ticks. Northwest doesn't really have too much of that. Yeah. Which you're pretty free, but that's what was fun about it too. Uh, the last trivia question. And, and then I'm going to talk about uh, Sai because you just mentioned Mount Sai. <laughs> I'm like, I want to hear more because this is like the history of these trails that I really want to know more of. Uh, the last trivia question. What is Jenny Jurek's trail name? What is Jenny Jurek's trail name? First correct answer gets the final book and water bottle. Uh, you mentioned Mount Sai. One of the legends that I heard early on about Scott Jurek was when you were training for Western States with Brian Morrison and you guys were doing 
a double weekend. So like Saturday, you'd go uh, run around Tiger Mountain for like 25, 35 miles or something. And then you would go do repeats on Mount Sai. Um, is that true? Is that legend true? Would you actually go up Mount Sai twice the day after doing like 25 Tiger Miles? So I usually stacked, I started doing, so doubles were something I learned about early in my running career from guys like Ben Hine and Tommy Nielsen. They would talk about oh, doing doubles. I had never done that where stacking two really hard long runs and Mount size were, you know, in that four hour range. Um, I did some triples, um, but yeah. I usually, I usually did. And yeah, it was like one of those things where Scott McCreary, when he first told me about, he's like, oh, there's this great workout you do. It's called, you know, double mount size. And and I thought to myself, well, in order to like break the course record of Western States or to win Western States and Angel's Crest, which is something I was trying to do at that time, I thought if I started doing triples, that would push me to where I needed to go. And so I started doing that. But I never I maybe with Brian once I did the Mount size on the second day. But usually what I would do is I went where I would do two to three Mount size, go and do basically a 12 peaks run or 12 summits as it was a. Uh, called back in the day. And I would do a 12 summit, which was 35 miles, 10,000 feet of vertical. And then extra special, um, towards the end of my days in Seattle, I started doing the rattlesnake to Cougar. And essentially what I, I called it the rattlesnake to Lake Washington, which is a 42 ish type run. Wow. And Uli Steidel and Brandon Sabrowski joined me on that first time where we traversed them all. And we had to connect a bunch of stuff that wasn't connected. And it was um it was a lot of fun. And I think that's that's what I love about trail running the most is like picking a route and saying I'm going to run from here to there and it was it was really cool. So I did that a few times as well where I did those three workouts back to back. And after doing that I'd be like I'm ready to go. Like it was it was a, a really good feeling. But it was a lot of miles. So uh, just hearing you talk about these routes cuz <laughs> you know we're coming up with our own routes uh as we're getting more and more uh deeper into these the local mountains and stuff like that because you know i grew up here but i never got a chance to explore them like i do now as an adult so i'm picking these lines i'm like oh this is crazy we have that race coming up on may 4th which is a triple oh, tiger right. and i'm like this is this is it like this is the <laughs> hardest route and you're like no it's not yeah. there's dozens of more difficult routes and just hearing what you're talking about for training i'm like oh god we need to really up our game <laughs> We have a correct answer, too. We do have a correct answer. The correct answer is coming from Sophie Berger. Congratulations, Sophie. The correct answer of Jenny Jurek's trail name is? Raven. Yay! <laughs> so you three individuals. Oh, sorry, Scott, go ahead. I oh, interrupted. Our daughter's name as well. Uh, who is in the background? Yes. In the but Does her she... full name is actually Ravenna. For neighborhood in Seattle, that we is so pretty. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. She's being very good, by the way. Oh, she okay. is. She's good. She's she's just now like lining up her books like tanks. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. uh, well, we for the three individuals who just won uh, books and bottles, please just drop me an email at thegingerrunner at gmail. We'll get you those. Uh, we'll figure out a way to get them directly mm -hmm. to you, whether that's through us or through Jenny and Scott. We'll make that happen. Congratulations. Um, we're going to wrap up our main show here with Scott and Jenny. We move into our post show, which is for our Patreon supporters at the $1 level or above. Basically, anyone who supports us on Patreon gets to join us for our after shows. Uh, we usually keep our guests for 10 or 15 minutes. We kind of rapid fire through the questions that don't get asked during the main show. Uh, it's a lot of fun, and it's a more candid look at our incredible guests that we have here week in and week out. So if you are uh, open to it, consider joining us at patreon.com slash the ginger runner. It supports everything that we do here. Before we go, into the after show. Scott and Jenny have been so gracious with their time, but it's also the first time they're joining us on the show. So we do have a segment that we like to call the quickie question quiz. It's a series of very easy questions. Uh, you just answer with the first thing that comes to your mind. It's uh, nine questions, I think. I always get that wrong. Mm -hmm. I think it's 11. Um, when you're ready to answer these quick questions, just give me a thumbs up. And what we'll do is I'll ask it and then we'll go Jenny and then Scott and we'll move on to the next one. So let me know when you're ready. Ready. <laughs> Let's do it. What was your very first race? Oh, what's that one called? Clay Elm Ridge Run. Oh, that's my first ultra. My first race was the Fremont 5K. Mine would have been the Park Point Kids Mile, which I dabbled in a little bit when I was young. Nice. <laughs> Favorite place to run currently? Beautiful. 
Indian Peaks Wilderness, just uh, 45 minutes from Boulder. Um, I like the Green Bear Trail here in Boulder. Road or trails? Trails. Both. <laughs> I, I still find enjoyment out of both. That's true. Bucket list race. Oh, I've always wanted to do Bighorn. And it's oh, it used to always be on my birthday and kind of um, way back in the day, that was that was always just like my what I epitomize as like the most amazing, beautiful run. So it's still on my list. I've always thought going and doing something like the bear, there's a bunch of races I want to do just to have nothing from a race standpoint um, and doing anything in particular, but just having fun and, and experiencing them. And I got to do Cascade Crest one of these years, too. Had He's you, only paced I, it. I was going to say. Oh. The course, but yeah, and paced it and helped out. But. <laughs> oh, yeah. please do it, Scott. Please do it. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite running movie? Mm. Mm. Let me think about that one. Uh, I thought the pre-Fontaine film was done pretty well for like a running film. If we're like outside a documentary. Right. Um, and I, I can't remember. I think it was the Billy uh, Crudup version. But um, I'd have to say like that one. That one in Endurance by Haile Geber Selassie. But if I were to say like old school, um, some people probably wouldn't. But the Billy Mills story. I remember watching that even before I was a runner mm -hmm. uh, with uh, I think even when I was. Yeah. Even in high school or younger and just it, it was super inspiring as people told me, oh, there's this crazy story about. This. Yeah. So, yeah. Sorry. Long winded answer, but probably the Billy Mills story. Yeah. If you want old school stuff. I don't I'm going to have to pass. I don't really watch running movies and I can't think of any right now. That's the Sorry. correct answer. No, <laughs> you got it right. <laughs> uh, I'm actually interested about this answer. Uh, guilty pleasure TV show. Ooh, I mean, Game of Thrones for sure. In Game of Thrones, for me, I'd say that's a definite. And then also like NBA basketball for me. Nice. <laughs> I the Sonics desperately. <laughs> Favorite pre-race meal? Ooh, I'm definitely avocado sushi. And I used to always be, and now it doesn't really matter. I'll eat just about anything, but I was a tempeh, basically quinoa or some type of uh, rice. Um, so somewhere along the lines there. Favorite post-race indulgence? Um, coconut water is always my first go-to. And I'd have to say, I'd say post-training too, because it's more of an indulgence. Uh, Panda puffs oh, are my sorry. like weak, weak spot. <laughs> <laughs> so like peanut, peanut butter bumpers, whatever, peanut butter Captain Crunch, you know, it's it's in that genre. So that's, <laughs> I it doesn't happen right after a race, but. That's funny because I think Panda Puffs is kind of my daily. <laughs> I think there's a box well, of them. Well, it is a daily, but that's... Do you get the bag? <laughs> you got to get the bulk. The it, bulk comes. it comes in oh. a bag. Don't like... tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> I, like the boxes are so nice because they're so limiting. It's like, oh, that's <laughs> two and a half bowls. Yeah, exactly. Um, and finally, what running kicks are you guys running in? What are the, what are the shoes that you're rocking? Uh, well, I mean, I wear whatever he told me I should wear <laughs> but I I wear the Brooks Pure Grit right now and then the um, Levitates right so it's called yep yeah, Levitate. Levitates and Which I'm launch on roads and then I'd have to say for trail it's uh, the Pure Grits I've gone, gotten some sevens now and I forget what number like I'm always working on earlier or later editions so they're uh they're like my staple shoe it's what I wear most on the Appalachian Trail too I have a couple pairs in my closet mm -hmm. Super solid. Congratulations. You both passed. Yay. The quickie oh, yeah. right. <laughs> Flying colors. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I try to set it up to make the guests stressed out. The reality is the questions are they're so basic. They're so easy. Um, I cannot thank you both enough for, for spending so much time with us tonight and, and for joining us in the post show, which we're going to start here in just a second. But before we go, can you please just let people know where they can find the book, where they can follow up with you guys, follow, find you on social media and all that good stuff? Best spot. I mean, you can go to scottjurek.com, but I'm a Scott Jurek on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. So that's probably the easiest way. Any of those um, mediums. And I've been trying to do a lot with Instagram stories, thanks to Jenny. She really prodded me along. So that's like the best way to catch up. Um, I don't post as regularly. I post um, 
pretty decent amount, but stories is like a, a fun place where I give a better glimpse of things. I always like try to make it good quality, uh, my other posts and I like get too like, yeah, just, it puts too much stress on me. <laughs> like <I always> put <laughs> up, uh, content. So that's why when you say you, you've done 250 some shows, I'm just like, wow. <laughs> it's hearing that he doesn't really do social media that much. I love that about him, but I'm also like, dude, does stuff the old Instagram account? <laughs> I'm like, wipe away the cobwebs because we need to post something. <laughs> so he's not as active, but um, that's kind of his only, his main place, I guess. Yeah. And then I'm um, directs on the run on Instagram, which is not that exciting, but um, it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, lots of kids stuff. But yeah, and then our book is sold everywhere. They sell books. I mean, in all formats. So ebooks, Apple, paper books, and the paperback is out. Um, so, and then if you paper. read it and you feel inclined, please leave a, a review, good or bad, just as long as it's honest. Um, but that definitely helps give people an idea of what it's about. Because a lot of people think it's just about running or it's like a, a daily blog of the trip. But, um, or people say, well, I followed on social media. Why would I want to read about it uh, again? So we tried to write it where people are like, it's definitely an insider view, but it's also you, you, people do tell us they still get gripped about it, even though they know the outcome. So hopefully. Uh, we can attest. Uh, we listened to it on a road trip recently mm -hmm. to Badger, and it's fantastic. And even the paperback is fantastic, which is available now or tomorrow because it's got pictures, it pictures it's got it. maps. Yeah. Uh, it's a great way to sort of compare and contrast from the two different versions. Again, if you'd like to join us in the post show, please do. Patreon.com slash The Ginger Runner for as little as a dollar a month. It supports everything we do here. These live shows, interviews, uh, reviews, films, everything that we have going on. A huge thank you to our wonderful guests tonight on episode 254. And uh, one thing that we like to do at the end of every show now is recognize a member of the community, uh, viewers, crew members who are kicking ass out there setting goals, crushing them, um, or just encountering obstacles and, and getting through it. And that we call that our crew member of the week. Uh, we actually have a couple this week because this last weekend was a pretty busy weekend for a lot of runners out there. And uh, this is awesome. So we'd like to recognize Rebecca Patrick. Congratulations, Rebecca. She was at American River uh, this weekend and had an, an amazing crew of people also from the community. It was really neat to sort of see how viewing members helped each other out. So a big shout out to uh, Rebecca, Josh Patrick, and Brian Goldman. Uh, Brian Goldman and Josh were there to help Rebecca uh, mm -hmm. attempt her AR-50. And uh, it's just really cool to see the community come together like that. And another big shout out also from AR-50, mm -hmm. Daisy, uh, AR-25, which also takes place at AR-50, but uh, Daisy Clark, a big shout out to Daisy, who's been a long time supporter of everything that we've been doing here. Uh, she crushed it. Uh, it was really cool to see her uh, run her ass off this weekend and nail it. So congratulations, Daisy, Rebecca, Josh, and Brian. Thank you so much for being members of this community and supporting one another in your goals. It's uh, it's really cool to see that. I think that's it. <coughs> I think that's it too. Yeah, we're going to move into the post show right now with uh, Scott and Jenny Jurek answering any of the questions I got asked during the main show, plus some um, extra questions. Uh, we'll have them for just a brief amount of time. So join us on over there if you have not already, patreon.com slash the ginger runner. That is it, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Uh, we'll see you next week from a Ginger Runner Live and lots of videos and stuff happening uh, this week. It's going to be pretty mm -hmm. exciting. And uh, that's it. Get out there. Train hard, race harder, and party the hardest. I know I am. Good night. Goodbye.